meeting of the policy review committee will come to order. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes and the live video footage of the September 17th and October 15th meetings represent the minutes of the meetings and the minutes stand approved as recorded. Uh, on to uh, item two, new business. At our last meeting, the committee agreed to discuss further at this meeting the two main discipline policies or behavior policies, uh, policies 5550 and 5560. We asked that staff provide us with additional data and return at this meeting in order to continue discussion of the discipline behavior policies. I ask, I welcome Dr. Martin Knox. Uh, Dr. Knox, would you please come forward? Good evening. Good evening. Um, I recall at our last meeting, uh, the committee members were asked to email any questions they had about the discipline behavior policies. Um, as no questions or comments were received, unless Dr. Martin Knox received any. No, sir, I did not. Um, uh, do the committee have any uh, further discussion on uh, these two policies, the first one being policy 5550? Um, I call your attention to the bottom of page seven. I, uh, first thing is the, uh, the David, if I may interrupt you very briefly, is there a line number on the left-hand side? Uh, line 39. 39, where it says P, possession and or use of a firearm on school property, one year expulsion. I think the P should be lowercase and conform with all the rest of the alphabet above it. Well, David, um, oh, I hear what you're saying, yeah, okay. And the, the, sentence makes, the sentence makes no sense from an English standpoint, mm -hmm. and I don't know why there's a, at the end, after expulsion, I don't understand why you got to, anyway, the, the, the sentence doesn't make any sense to me, unless I'm reading it totally wrong. Well, you're, I think what you're saying is. Um, Something missing in there. Like, like a verb? Well, I don't, <coughs> A, some word or two. <laughs> Possession and or use of a firearm on school property, one year hyphen, results in, I mean, I don't know, some, something. Um, well, I think it's a cut and paste, or in the alternative, what's in the student um, um, handbook is a cut and paste from the policy. But uh, I would ask uh, committee staff, Ms. Halley, um, because of what's uh, sort of shown there, uh, would the staff any recommendations about how that um, should be worded with that uh, sort of hanging parentheses? Just go over to page seven and go down to line 39 and line 40. And I think, I mean, it, it, there, David's correct, there is no uh, other parentheses. There's a parentheses at the end in line 40, it's, uh, at the end of the word expulsion. Um, I suspect it's, it's to indicate some mandatory um, consequence, but uh, it's not clear because uh, the punctuation is not correct and one could argue that the wording could be changed. And that's what we were hoping that Miss uh, Halley could address, but she appears to have stepped away from her workstation. <laughs> and we thank David for his keen eye uh, that he brings from his extensive experience and participation on the board. Just proves I was reading. <laughs> David, do you have anything else that you wanted to uh, bring to anyone's attention? No, I, I'm just curious as what, what what should the wording actually be? Sure. Well, when uh, when Miss Halley returns, we'll have uh, her comment on uh, from a staff perspective. It's been a one year suspension. I was a bit more focused on uh, taking it perhaps a page at a time and um, directing uh, committee members' attention to lines 14 and 15 um, uh, on page one. Could someone from, from the staff explain to us um, the following line? Um, appropriate behavior be communicated, supports and interventions be provided, and consequences, and this is really the key, for inappropriate behavior be communicated and administered equitably as opposed to some other kind of word, I mean some other word. Equitably, 
Uh, is that referencing um, some, some, some in, uh, just what do you mean by that as opposed to equally? So each situ situation where a student is engaged in inappropriate behavior, um, it is actually, again, the determination made by the school-based administrators and when it's equitably, so if there are multiple students who are engaging in the same activity, the approach should be the same for all as opposed to a variance in terms of the consequence that's administered. So could you give an example, please? So let's say you and I decided to engage in a physical altercation and uh, we were both physical toward one another that once we've met with the administrator that you and I will receive the same or similar consequence um, for the same type of behavior. Um, there could also be a situation where if there's two students who engaged in a physical altercation like you and I, not that I would ever do that, Mr. Verge, um, that if a student has um, had several interventions and has had several parent conferences, that that student's behavior at that particular time may warrant a more uh, strict consequence um, as opposed to the other student. So it's based on a case-by-case -case basis, but it, it is aligned to the student handbook as well. So the distinction is that the word equal doesn't account for the individual attributes of a student if more than one student were participating in your scenario. Say that again. I got it. The word equitable is what's, what's recommended for this as opposed to the word equal because of perhaps in your scenario, two students, you and I, the attributes that I bring and the attributes that you brought to that conflict may be different and therefore warrant a different consequence. That's correct. And or extent of consequences. That's correct. Gotcha. So one could have um, a track record of engaging in such behavior. Um, let's say you're the one who's had consistent behaviors um, that have been addressed, whereas that may have been my first occurrence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, I just wanted maybe just to add to the discussion, um, certainly as we talk about equity policies and equity throughout school systems and policies, there is certainly an emphasis made that there is a difference between e equality and equity. And I just thought of um, a student with some physical disabilities that uh, may become involved in a physical altercation. Uh, depending on what those physical abilities might be, you can't expect someone who's physically limited to react all the time the same one as someone totally physically capable. And then, as Dr. Knox, I would think, was saying, depending on, as, and as you said also, depending on what a student brings to the situation, the policies would apply perhaps in a different manner. And I can extend on the example that you've provided. So let's utilize a student with special needs as well. Um, according to law, students with special needs can be suspended up to 10 days. Um, let's say we had a student who has special needs who has already exhausted his or her 10 days, then the school would have to make the decision of going back to the table and having a formalized team to determine if the placement were appropriate and if his or her IEP uh, meets his or her needs. So there's also something called um, uh, a manifestation of his or her disability. If a student has goals in his or her IEP that says that they are, we are to work with them uh, to help them with diffusing and processing, uh, that student would be addressed differently than his or her counterpart as a result of the IEP um, or the special needs. I'd like to welcome our student member. Hello. Welcome. Uh, we're focused on page one, although there, there has been a comment about uh, page seven and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, Halima, do you have any comments with regard to page one of uh, policy 5550? Um, Is there a line that you could reference, please? Oh, yes, line 11, 10, 10, mm -hmm. 10, 10. So if you, had a, if you were to suggest something different, how would you like that line to read? And you can use like the phrase.
So what you're suggesting then, if, if I hear you, is that it would read for effective teaching and learning. Yes. I see. Mm -hmm. And would you like to make a motion for that? Yes. All right, uh, and please make that motion. I make the motion <laughs> to amend policy 5550, line 10, where it says teaching to add and learning. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed, say no and don't raise your hand. Okay, so that's it's unanimous. Very good. Liam, anything else on page one? No. Very good. David, do you have anything on page one that you'd like to uh, have attention directed to? Kathleen, um, page one. Welcome. Thank you. And um, thank you, Dr. Knox. So I had questions around um, line 35 where it's talking about provide school administrators with discretion to impose various disciplinary consequences for violations. Um, the, the overall question is, is there a superintendent's rule that has been developed along with this policy? Um, if so, does it have discretion um, parameters in terms of how is it noted when an administrator uses discretion over what is typically recommended according to the code of conduct? And how is, are there parameters giving guidance to administrators in their empowerment to use discretion, but also guidelines around it, around choosing what the discretion is, but also in documenting what the discretion is. So is there any of, or all of that in the rule? So when we um, look at the student handbook, um, the student handbook uses the language a principal may. Um, and that has been a conversation um, that we've actually provided professional development for our principals when the language shifted because it used to say shall and now it says may, which gives principals that authority to make the determination in terms of what consequences are most appropriate based on the investigation and the behaviors. So is, so there's language guiding our administrators already in the current superintendent's rule? May I take a moment to go and look before I misspeak? So governed by the student handbook, the language that a leader may. Um, so it's spelled out completely in the handbook. Um, looking in the rule, um, I'm going to look at it at this time. Um, if you look at the rule in standards three, <clears throat> excuse me, in standard uh, 3B, um, it indicates that uh, conduct procedures may be subject to disciplinary. So in alignment with the language in the handbook, it is in the rule. Okay, but there's no guidelines or specifications or standards related to documenting when discretion is used in terms of documenting why. So for a student behavior incident, there may be the, um, as you said, manifestation of a disability and, and an equitable uh, consequence would be perhaps less than a typical student would receive for similar behavior. But so where is that recorded or is that recorded or is that something that we should consider in the future in terms of understanding how the administrators are using their empowerment? So in terms of the example you provided that um, piggybacked on the earlier comment, when a student has a manifestation hearing, that is the documentation that is utilized. Um, but again, principals use the information that they've gathered from um, investigations to make the determination of the most appropriate consequence for the specific behavior. If I might just interrupt you right there, if you could just take a moment for 
Um, folks who may be watching, uh, when you use the term manifestation hearing, could you just elaborate on that very briefly? Yes, sir. So students who have been identified with special needs or students who have a 504, when they engage in said behaviors, um, we actually have a meeting, um, which is called a manifestation meeting, to determine whether the behaviors that student engaged in are as a result of his or her disability. So if we have a student who has been identified, let's say, as emotionally disturbed, and they have certain triggers, and those triggers have been um, tapped into, and that child responds, uh, the decision as to um, the consequence is usually determined at that hearing. Um, during the hearing, it's usually a special educator, um, the general educator, the administrator, the IEP chair, um, in some cases, the student and his or her parent, depending upon whether it's a local suspension or a board suspension. But there's collaboration with members of the team um, to determine if that behavior was a, as a result of um, behaviors that are what we've identified as beyond the student's control at that particular point in time. And to the member's question, the documentation for what transpired at the manifestation hearing, if you could just also briefly share with folks how that documentation is done. So the IEP chair um, maintains that information and it's maintained in a confidential file of that student. Um, it's usually a part of his or her IEP um, uh, packet or information and it's also maintained electronically in a system we call TINET um, so that wherever that child may be someone can see um, the behaviors that the child exhibits or a part of his or her IEP that um, provides um, the supports to help us with the, the development of that child to understand those behaviors are inappropriate. Very good. Kathleen, I interrupted you because I just wanted to make sure that the folks who may not have the sophistication that some of our staff or our, our board members have also have the benefit of that information. So there's some other questions you have uh, on this page. Please go right ahead. Okay. That's actually very helpful, Steve. I appreciate that. No, that's, that's good. That answers that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, if that uh, concludes our uh, review of page one, if we might now uh, take a look at um, uh, page two. And um, directing um, uh, Dr. Martin Locke's attention to line eight, uh, you'll see uh, it reads three, to on-site or off-site school hyphen related problems, which are the result or cause of disruptive behavior on school grounds. And I wanted to just um, ask you, uh, just that part there, school-related problems, what, that seems kind of an, uh, um, a vague term. Could you let us know what staff was reaching for with that language, please? And I apologize, are you looking in the definitions? I'm looking at a non-numbered non copy, well, so. We can get you a number. We can get you a numbered copy. Hang on here a second. I appreciate the support. So, Mr. Virch, which line are you referring to again? I'm sorry. And I noted that what's in the binder, the, you know, those white pages. It's helpful for the board members to be able to, like, move quickly. And so directing your attention to page two and over to um, line uh, eight. And uh, it reads, three, two on-site or off-site school-related problems. So... Um, what does that mean? So, if a student engages in behaviors in a school-sponsored event, whether it's during the normal scope of, or within the schoolhouse, or whether it's on a field trip. So, just giving an example, if a student, if we took a field trip to the zoo, and a student engaged in behaviors that are not aligned to the handbook and the policies, that a consequence could be levied um, just because they're not on the school site. Um, they're still um, participating in a school-sponsored event. So this this language helps us to uh, address those behaviors should they occur. The reason why I asked is on first viewing, it looked like to on-site or off-site school-related problems. 
and I wasn't sure whether that was for something that occurred outside of school between two students, um, but um, I understand so now. Mr. Yeah, Birch, in addition to mm -hmm. the explanation that Dr. Martin Knox has provided, uh, the shorthand that staff use for this section is scope of authority. Mm -hmm. So if there is something that occurs in the community, and as a result of something that occurs in the community, there's a disruption um, in the schoolhouse. Um, an example that is much more recent is online bullying or online conduct. That certainly does not occur or does not always occur during the school day or on school grounds, but notwithstanding the location of the behavior, the question is whether or not the location of the behavior, the behavior itself spills over into the schoolhouse. And if it does, um, there's very good case law, um, and it's, this, is, this type of language has been in your um, policy for many years that permits local boards of education, local school systems, to still take action. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and that's what I was hopeful it was saying. Uh, directing your attention then down to um, um, lines 20 and lines 26. Lines 20, 23, 26. It says, acts of students which occur away and apart from school and school property shall be subject to discipline if such acts can be shown to pose a threat or danger to the safety of other students, staff, or school property, and or the act or acts prevent, uh, or prevents, because obviously it's worded prevents because of the word act, it should be, of course, prevent for the word acts, the orderly delivery of the institutional program at school. Based on your experience in education, could you just, for the board members, provide a couple of examples of that? Sure, so this goes to what Ms. Howie just explained, which is the school's scope of authority or portal to portal. If students engage in behaviors outside of the normal scope of the school day and those incidents or behaviors spill over into the school and impacts the instructional program, then consequences can be lived, um, levied uh, against those students. So it, it goes back to the portal to portal or the school's scope of authority. Um, so I can give an example mm -hmm. um, of when I was a principal. I had a situation that had transpired in a movie theater um, on a Sunday, and the students engaged in inappropriate behaviors, and when they saw one another again on Monday, the behaviors almost continued, but it was disruptive. Um, there was noise being made in terms of kids uh, buzzing about it, and teachers weren't unable to teach. So as a result of those behaviors spilling back into the schoolhouse, a consequence was levied for that behavior. And there was also another student who was involved who was afraid to come to school. Um, and when we have a child who is afraid to come to school as a result of a particular behavior, um, as a principal can levy a consequence. So this goes back to the school scope of authority. Right. So what I want to get to is I get if there's a if there's a if there's a spillover into the school and there's some specific act which occurs at the school. So people are at a movie off site, it's on a weekend and they get into a disagreement. And then on the school grounds uh, or inside a building they see each other and someone let's say they throw a punch, for example. I see that action. But if something happens at a movie theater and the nature of what occurred is whatever occurred there and then uh, around comes Monday and, and the, 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 the students who were at the uh, movie theater but were not uh, at a school function, they now come to school, two of them and there were three of them and one doesn't come because they're afraid because of what occurred at the movie theater, the school system is not able to impose a a sanction or a consequence on one or the other students of the three because one of the three is not comfortable coming to school. I can see an intervention of some type, but it's not something that would result in a behavior discipline consequence. Is that because then potentially it then puts the system in the position of, of acting as uh, an all-around community enforcement mechanism for what may or may not occur on school grounds. 
but I get the consequence part, maybe need for some kind of interpersonal intervention. But I just wanted to make sure I understood what, what you were using in your example. So yes, sir. So if the behaviors spill into the school and they cause a disruption mm -hmm. um, to the point where the teacher is unable to teach or kids are afraid to come to school as a result of those behaviors, the school can levy a consequence. Oftentimes when students engage in inappropriate behaviors and the police are, are involved, we get a report called a CRO, which is, I'm sorry for the acronym, a criminal reportable offense. Depending on those behaviors, a school can le levy the sanction if it prevents someone else from coming to school um, I could I could I could just give you okay, one please, more example um, so as a high school administrator um, I had two students who um, school had dismissed they got on the bus they're seven miles away from the school they get off the bus at their stop the bus pulls away the kids have an altercation as a school administrator I was able to administer discipline for that altercation that technically happened in the community, um, but it was a result of a school-related conflict. Well, thank you for the example. I mean, I can see the open-endedness of this creating a host of issues. Now, if the position of, the, uh, of those who would be in our schools is that's one of the reasons that we need to have a, a, dis a type of discretion I can also understand the idea of a discretion. But then, once we go down the road of discretion, the concern becomes what measuring criteria then is employed to determine whether there should be a school administered, meaning a principal administered okay. sanction. And that becomes really the, the real difficult part for me. I mean, I do see the link to the bus, and I see the link that they're students, and, and perhaps what, a, what, what triggered what occurred occurred in the school, but what if it, it, the bus pulls away, and I, I know that you, I appreciate you bringing that fact, the bus pulls away, and the two have a disagreement about which sports team's the best sports team in the world, and then there's a punch thrown. Anyway, I just use an example. Um, Malima? Um, I think the whole idea is pretty subjective, and it's one of if it deems fit, the principal or administrator should be able to take action. In a sense, growing up, well, at middle school, although it happened on social media, the act or acts, it will eventually spill into the school day no matter what. It might not spill the next day, but it, over time, what is going on outside of school will affect what's going on inside of school. Whether it's on social media, kids will start talking about it, flares will start rising. So principals, if deemed fit, they see that this is something that's affecting, they should, they will be able to. I know my principals growing up have been able to, um, decide that this is a situation where they step into simply because it's affecting students that attend those schools and it's two students that attend a certain school or it's two students that attend a different school oftentimes even at the school I attend if it's a student at my high school or another high school they're able to come in and say this is a problem this is something we have to stop ahead of time no matter it's simply the fact that there's students in the school they're not they're not of not property like they're not under the they're under the ruling of BCPS and we can also um, engage in again looking at our framework of prevention logical consequences of restoration there are times where our counselors and our administrators have to restore those relationships it may not relate in a suspension but it may relate to them having to have a mediation um, because those behaviors as you so put it, do spill over into the schoolhouse. And when everyone is involved and children aren't mentally focused because they're too busy worried about what has been posted on social media or what transpired beyond the school's scope, um, when those behaviors are brought into the school and prevents a child from learning, there are times where we have to do uh, some sort of restoration to try to repair those relationships. And if it continues, even after engaging in some sort of restoration approach, um, involving their parents as well, if the behaviors would continue even after that, then it may be a more harsh consequence that's levied. Um, but that is, again, based on the Im information that administrators have uh, captured in their investigative process. If I may just ask you, and I, I know we have other members who want to ask questions, if I may just ask you, is the answer, it depends on whether 
the use of a restorative practice as an option is a consequence or a preemptive tool to other behavior consequences? It's a, it's a preventative strategy. Um, it's preventative, and it can also be a part of the process to restore, but it is not in lieu of a consequence. It will be a consequence and the restoration, because again, when you suspend a child, in most cases, they've not learned. Uh, the suspension doesn't teach, and so the process is for us to teach our children. Um, and I think I said when um, I originally presented the information that uh, in alignment with the guidance from MS SDE, that it's about the rehabilitative process and helping our children understand the appropriate ways to act, not only in school, but as we're preparing them to be productive citizens as well. But restorative practices are also a discretion on a, a discretional option of the principal. Is that right? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, Kathleen? One of to uh, go back to. Um, Dr. McComas and her example, one of the examples that I've heard um, is that if there, because we don't want to have school system overreach into the community, but at the same time, we are responsible for the safety of the students, as Ms. Howie pointed out, portal to portal. And if there is an incident that happens in the community, but then would potentially cause a problem of safety on a school bus the next day, there may be a consequence related to uh, the privilege of riding a school bus. Um, so it, there are times when the administrators need to use discretion in advance in order to prevent a potential uh, safety issue happening when they know that there are conflicts happening outside the, the schoolhouse. So that's a situation where I've heard where something happened in the community, but the administrators needed to act preventively to make sure that there wasn't a potential altercation on the bus the next morning before they could get back to the schoolhouse. So we, there are a wide variety of behaviors. There's a wide variety of when they happen and how they happen, but the overall goal is that when those students are in our area of responsibility, that we are making the situation as safe as we can for them and as effective a learning and teaching environment. So there, there's a lot of different situations that our administrators deal with, and um, there are times when they have to use their discretion in that way. Any other uh, questions or um, uh, motions with regard to uh, page three? Trade strike that, page two. Yes, Kathleen. Thank you. So, Dr. Knox, when we're talking in uh, paragraph E, disciplinary infractions that constitute violations of criminal statutes will be reported to appropriate law enforcement officials. And you, re you uh, referred to that as a CRO. Where is that documented? Is that an always, or is that also up to administrator discretion? And then when they are reported, then it is up to law enforcement whether charges are pressed. Is that correct? So it actually, again, goes back to if that behavior that that child engaged in beyond the scope of impacts the schoolhouse and the learning, um, if a child engages in behaviors outside that does not spill back over into the school, the principals and the administrators usually do not address it. Um, they will receive the criminal reportable offense to show that the child has uh, had uh, interaction with law enforcement, but it, you, we're using, we use that tool, and I say we, um, we use that tool just to make sure we're putting supports in place for that child, because if that behavior is taking place in, um, in the community, we just want to make sure students don't bring the behavior to school, um, but how we can help them along the way. So um, every reported offense does not warrant a consequence. Okay. I was actually speaking to um, criminal reportable offenses that occur in school, in the schoolhouse, on school property. So is that, the way I read this is that there's not discretion to report them, that every CRO is reported to law enforcement. So CROs are only reported when it occurs outside of the school. When there's a child that breaks the law, the law is the law, and the SROs address it and deal with it. So there's nothing that prevents an SRO from becoming involved in a criminal matter. 
Okay, so there's not discretion to administrators in reporting to the SRO when there are criminal violations in the schoolhouse. They work and complete the investigations in collaboration with the SROs, and if it's a criminal matter, then the SRO will charge. So there is no, if you charge, then I'll do this, or I'll do this, and then you charge. If it's, an, if it's a violation of the law, the SRO will charge the child. So that's a distinct action from the consequence or restoration that the, that the administrator, the principal, would um, enact for the student. So that's a separate process that's happening. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then how are those, um, how are those behaviors by students that do constitute violations of criminal statute, how are those recorded? And then does the school keep track of what, what the SRO does or they don't? In terms of is an assault, do, are there charges pressed or there's not? So it varies, it's situation okay. to situation. So um, the SRO, again, if it's a behavior that is illegal, then the SRO can uh, implement charges. And what the principal usually um, acquires from that situation is a copy of the police report. Um, but it is not documented in the student's school file because it's a legal uh, matter. Um, so there, okay. does, does that answer the question? I'm sorry, am I on the right track? Yes, you are. So, it, so, the, so the legal documents are not kept in the student information system? That's in the correct. Files. We actually have a count of those charges, but not the specific incidents themselves. Okay, so I guess the concern is if you have a new administrator in a building and they have student files and a student exhibits a behavior, is there a way for that administrator to know the history. So we talked about an equitable consequence. How will the new administrator know what the history of that student is? Usually the counselor, the school counselor will have background information. The assistant principal may have background information. Um, and again, if you go into the student information system, you can see that there was some sort of behavior because there's usually notes, but not the actual police report. So you can actually see the student's history. Okay, and all of that is then tightly confidential. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. If I might just ask your attention about that, the language, disciplinary infractions that constitute violations of criminal statutes. It doesn't say rise to, the, to a certain level of burden of proof. It just says disciplinary infractions that constitute violations of criminal statutes. So that's beyond a reasonable doubt standard. That's, you know, if somebody was using numbers, they'd say it's n probably over 90%. Um, so I'm trying to get a sense of what is intended by the use of the word that constitute violations of criminal statutes. Now I can think of an example. Uh, there's a camera in a hallway and a student comes to the hallway with a bunch of paper and pulls out a lighter and, and lights a fire in the, uh, in the hallway. And it's on videotape. Now, you know, all things being equal, and the person, you know, that, and the person has a sign that says, my name is, and that's who they are. So we know that that's the person who started a fire, and it's arson. But let's say there's a fight that occurred in the locker room, or there's some conflict that occurred in a locker room, and kids are running towards it until an administrator gets there, the two kids get separated, but one's got a cut on their face. Well, you know, if a child is struck, you know, that's a, uh, that's a, assault, but if someone swings and misses and the, the, the person who was swung at said, you know, was in fear of being struck, that's also an assault. So what I'm trying to get to is the, the, the level of proof first that an administrator has because there is no, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt standard that is used by principals. They just kind of more likely than not standard in a, in a school. So is there better language than disciplinary infractions that constitute violations of criminal statutes when there hasn't even been a criminal trial will be reported to appropriate law enforcement officials? 
is there some language that staff can come up with that really speaks to the, the level of proof that uh, an administrator in a school is going to have to find before this is reported? I mean, it may just be, it may be something similar, but we're just trying to, I'm just trying to understand what, what level a principal has to get to to then have something that constitutes a criminal, um, a violation of a criminal statute. And you don't have to do it tonight, but I think that's something the that staff's going to need to come back with with some language. Uh, that's just my sense. Um, did you read Comar? Yeah. Did it, what did it say? Well, it's, it Is doesn't. Is that the language from Comar? Yeah, but it doesn't speak to the burden of proof that has to be met by the administrator. That's the concern I have. Well, there is the what burden of proof doesn't have anything to do with a violation. Sure it does. It does? Yes, because it says disciplinary infractions that constitute violations. Okay. So what's the level of proof? It, it is not like an on-off switch on a wall. It's more likely than not that somebody did something. That's not a violation of a criminal statute. It's whether beyond a reasonable doubt they did. And that's why I was just asking staff to go and look and see if there's some additional language. That's the only difference there. Any other uh, questions with regard to page two? So may I also yes, go back go and provide clarification? So we were talking about criminal reportable offenses earlier, mm -hmm. and this language, from my perspective and my professional, uh, we'll go back and look at it definitely, but all matters that are criminal mm -hmm. are reported to the authorities by the school-based administrators. Um, I was addressing Mrs. Causey earlier when we were talking about behaviors that transpired in, outside of the community, that when the police um, write a report that we are then notified of said behaviors. But if there's anything similar to what you've just described, it is criminal in nature and it must be reported to the school's SRO um, or the law enforcement. So from my interpretation and my understanding and my engagement with this type of language from my experiences as a principal, this is something that constitutes um, the violations of a criminal statute. If it is legal, then the child can be held accountable and the law office, not the law office, I apologize, the uh, officials must be notified and those officials I'm referring to are the police. Okay. Any other questions with regard to page two? Uh, directing the committee's attention to page three and um, uh, Dr. Knox, Martin Knox, if you could just uh, take a look at line six. Um, it's under the definition section, uh, line 6A, cyberbullying. The use of electronic communication to harm or harass others in a deliberate, repeated, and hostile manner. What I wanted to ask you about is the use of the word others. Is others intended to be students, school staff, family members of students, family members of school staff, or is others to include the universe? So somebody that's uh, doing cyberbullying who's one of our students, but he's doing cyberbullying, uh, you know, of someone in, say, Kazakhstan, for example. Is that something that the school is going to engage, you know, is going to engage on this matter and then pursue uh, some type of consequence for the cyberbullying online by a student who was cyberbullying somebody in Kazakhstan? So this more so is if it impacts the operations of the school or the instructional program, so the others would be an adult in the building or their peers. Um, but I can also provide an example of a cyberbullying case that um, I actually had to deal with maybe two years ago where a student um, within our school system was um, harassing someone in another school system um, because they had a connection due to the nature of the language and the threat that was used, the school was able to levy a consequence because it um, prompted the reaction of the police and law enforcement. Um, so others really specifies those who are their peers or the adults, but depending upon the type of threat or the bullying that's taking place, a school can or the administrators can levy a consequence. So for example, a student who's bullying somebody in Kazakhstan but is using a BCPS issued device. Cyberbullying because the link is the device. And the link is the device and, and the telecommunications acceptable use sure. policy. I got you and, 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 I, and I could see that. Um, but you know, let's say unfortunately it's someone at home and they're using, and it's a student of ours and they're using the family's device to do cyberbullying and there's no impact inside of the classroom or in the school where the student is a student. 
Is that the, is that the bright line? that would keep the system from then imposing a sanction or yeah, a sanction or some other consequence on the student of ours that's been engaging in cyberbullying. So if it's not impacting the instructional program, there usually is not a consequence for a student who's engaging. And I think the key when you mentioned earlier was the use of the school's device because they're violating the telecommunications acceptable use policy. Um, but in the same token, it depends on the threat and what's occurring. Um, so I will use an, another example. Um, when we have the um, imitation behaviors of school threats that uh, there's a detonated device somewhere in another school in another state or another system and it has caused a disruption to that school and the child has engaged uh, not only is it criminal but it is something that the school administrator can address well I guess w w where I'm going with this is you would use you given us several different parts that I think strengthen the definition for the better but it's not in there now, one of which is, and one in, I mean, words to the effect and when it impacts in the school community or impacts what occurs in the school. So maybe that is a phrase that would trail afterwards. Um, and if a device, if a school issued devices is, if a system issued device is used in the cyberbullying, or if, um, technology or uh, um, physical or hardware that's, 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 that's owned by the system is used in this. See, the idea, is that the, the idea here is that the word others is kind of vague. So I could get it if it's students, I can get it if it's family, I can get it if it's staff. And we have 20,000 staff members. We certainly don't want them bullied. We don't want their family members bullied. But so is there a way to tighten up others? Now maybe without us being so expansive, that includes the universe and then identifying the effect which is within our school community. And I hate to use the word community because that is undefined. And that's what I would like staff to look at for alternate language. And I'm open to suggestions from, yeah, Chuck. I think everybody has a question here. Um, I have a question for Dr. Martin Knox and Dr. McComas. I was thinking back to a presentation that Dr. Martin Knox made a couple months ago with an SRO and he talked about school security and we asked what keeps him up at night and he mentioned things with social media. And I think of the emails and contacts that I've received, so many of them um, in terms of cyberbullying take place with social media. And we talk a lot about devices and the, type, the, the mechanism that's used. But I just wondered if we should have any more specificity about social media in particular when we talk about cyberbullying. And, and it's a question, it's not a suggestion. Um, to dissuade um, the casual bullying that might take place on, uh, through a tweet or, or Facebook. And, and when we review these again seven years from now, who knows what's going to be out there. But, I just thought about social media. When you review these in seven years, Jeff. Uh, but um, I, di I just didn't know how you felt about social media specifically in terms of this policy and bullying, uh, whether we needed any more force in our policy to dissuade that. Um, I think that it is necessary because that seems to be the tool or the venue of choice in most cases where uh, people are using that as a shield, shall I say, um, falsifying identifications. Um, I think that the, necess the necessity to have cyberbullying in here definitely helps because it hasn't always been in here. Um, and as you said, seven years from now, we may be addressing something else. But at this particular point in time, the definition of cyberbullying, um, of course, taking the, the um, language that Mr. Virch just shared in terms of this vagueness um, to take back to the table to make sure we can strengthen that. Because each and every day, there's a different tool that's utilized. Um, but because it changes, changes regularly, um, we do have uh, this broad scope to look at cyberbullying so that we can address uh, situations as they arise. So when students look at cyberbullying term, I guess, my, is that specific enough for them to know, connect that 
specifically with social media. I, I just want to make sure that the message is Cyber getting. Is social media. Well, I, that's what I just I mean, want to. It's anonymous. I don't, I don't know how you can okay. accept it, in my opinion. All right, that's fine. Uh, I wanted to go back to the whole others thing, because if you limit it to our school community, it exposed the whole idea of when something was going on within Baltimore County and another student, like a student was harassing somebody else in Montgomery County. In a sense, eventually, that student is held accountable by BCPS. So if you are exhibiting such traits, such as like such um, bad things, such as cyberbullying, you're not upholding the BCPS standard, so you should be held accountable in a sense of if you're, conf if you're harming or causing conflict to somebody else in a different county. So I don't, know, it's, I don't know if there's a way that we can not just limit it to the school community such as BCPS in the sense that maybe discre discretion is advised or something like that that doesn't just, because then eventually just it allows the students to think that, oh, because when I grow older, because I'm not affecting somebody next door, I can affect somebody 10,000 miles away. And they never learned that lesson of like, either way it's wrong. So I just want to remind the board that you do have a bullying and cyberbullying policy. It's referred to uh, in uh, your related policies. It's policy 5580. And it defines both bullying, harassment, and intimidation and cyberbullying basically as bullying that occurs in the virtual world. Kathleen? Thank you. Um, I did want to go back to the um, comment made about uh, cyberbullying and others. And it would be my understanding that going back to page one, line 39, paragraph B, the provisions of the Student Behavior Code shall apply, and then it provides those specific times when it applies, during all school-sponsored activities, on travel, on site, or when that student behavior outside the schoolhouse will bring potential conflict, danger, disruption inside the schoolhouse. So while the Board of Education of Baltimore County wants to model to our students and encourage them to be well behaved at all times, we don't want to expand our role into the community unnecessarily. But certainly, as you were mentioning with our technology and appropriate use policy, if students are using or staff, any employee are using our um, board issued devices inappropriately, then consequences or um, um, additional education can take place. So I think that's appropriate. So we, we want to be inclusive to make sure that we can try and do what our policy wants, which is to maintain an environment of order, safety, and, and discipline necessary for effective teaching and learning. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to go beyond our scope. So I think that in terms of cyberbullying, we do have a good application. When does it apply that a student could uh, receive a consequence for cyberbullying? I think that that's well defined. Um, and my question, Ms. Howie, under 5580, um, does it use the word social media in there? Because I do agree with Mr. McDaniels that that might not be exactly what students are thinking about if they're thinking about electronic communication as being more email. Maybe they don't consider Snapchat, which may just be pictures. You know what I'm saying? So I, I would be interested in making sure that something specific to social media is outlined. It and could that be outlined. is subsection 2C. Um, number two, cyberbullying includes the use of social media sites and all of the other means identified, uh, which would be electronic communication. And then sub one also says it includes, but is not limited to the use of social media sites. Okay, that takes care of it, I think. Thanks. Anything further on uh, page three? Uh, moving on to uh, page four. 
I wanted to ask you with regard to uh, page four um, and also to the certain extent at the bottom of page three where we begin offenses, we say category one, it's italicized. I know we have our own manual of style and I don't, I don't believe itali itali italization is, is part of the style manual. But going to page four where we have these bold headings and then we have um, lowercase letters underneath of them. It seems, it seems that if we're going to use the heading, which I get for putting it in the handbook, but in terms of the policy, this isn't, this isn't how we, our style manual is supposed to read. So without getting to the substantive nature of what's written, the way it appears, the headings need to be incorporated as part of the lowercase letters, if in fact that's what the sense was there. And it may simply be a matter of making the lowercase letter the heading, and then um, if there's, as there is with attendance, uh, five different items, then it'd be small one through small, I, small five. And directing your attention down to the um, uh, line 29 with regards to the transportation uh, regulations. Um, I want to give you this example. There's a stop on, say, um, Park. And there's two actual, two actual bus stops on Park Road or Drive in the 6th District. And where I want to go with this is uh, someone who's assigned to, um, you know, the, the second stop goes up and is now riding on the first stop. Now, is that a violation of our transportation regulations for a kid to be riding uh, or catching the bus on a stop that they're not assigned to? From a practical matter, well, if the bus gets to the first one first and then goes to the second one, there's no big deal. But if the kid is going to a different bus stop for whatever reason that's not on the original route, is that a transportation regulation violation? Yes, it would be because the children are assigned bus stops very early on in the school year, in the beginning of the school. Um, and those stops are designated to make sure the students are getting on at the appropriate spot, but it's also a safety issue more so than anything else so that we can take account of our children. Um, but the bus stops are assigned um, and we need to make sure students are riding the appropriate bus and boarding and uh, exiting on the appropriate stops. Um, so will I say that students have been suspended for that? Typically, no, they've been addressed and the parents have been made aware that the child needs to ride a specific bus. However, if the behavior does continue, then the administrators have uh, the authority to levy a consequence. And the use of the word cooperate, because it says refusing to cooperate with school rules and or regulations in uh, line 28, or refusing to cooperate with school transportation regulations, isn't what we're really saying refusing to follow? Is there a reason we would use cooperate over the word follow? or abide by? That's a good point. I'll make sure I take it back to the team for us to discuss it further. Um, yes, Halim. Okay, so as of recent, um, my classmates, my peers, are talking about the whole jewel epi not epidemic, but jeweling problem, and how it's seen as a light situation based on how relatively new it is, but the harmful effects is, is lengthy or whatever. So when um, we talk about dangerous substances, I see it seems like a repetition if you put it under category one and then you basically say the same thing in category two but just in different wording. So then the problem is that with students, they don't take it lightly. The whole harmful substances, tobacco, jeweling, weed, whatever it may be. And it's one of those a student expressed that all the teacher said was put your jeweling thing away. So it's one of those, where does it, should it just be placed under two so the level of infraction is like magnified that this is that wrong or would we just leave the whole idea of two different definitions of dangerous substances, H and I, compared to F, G, H and I, I, J in category two? 
So the difference would be for the two under category one, it would be more so like your tobacco, just cigarettes or black and milds or whatever the latest fad is, that would be that. But the other part in category two, it is actually the non-controlled substances, the dangerous substances. Uh, so that's where the drugs would come into play for the category twos. But under ones, it's specifically referring to a cigar, cigarettes, Halima, anything further? Is there anything else you'd like? Okay. Uh, Kathleen, do you have any questions? I agree with you about the style issues in terms of recategorizing small a's and then the ones, um, or lowercase and then, and then the numbers. I think that follows along <clears throat> better with what we're, um, with how we've done that in the past. And I also appreciate the delineation between dueling with tobacco versus dueling with drugs or controlled substances because those are a greater health risk as well as a CRO. So um, thank you for that. That's all for that for me right now. Anything further on, I, I guess not, not, nothing further on page four. If we can go to page five and um, wherever David is, I wish him well. He had let me know that he'd have to leave at 530. Um, we will get, uh, hopefully we'll get to page seven and uh, take care of his question. Um, directing your attention to page five, line seven, um, it refers to the use of electronic devices for non-educational purposes during regular instructional hours. The ban on use of electronic devices for non-educational purposes also applies to buses while being transported to and from school and while participating in school-sponsored activities. What I'm trying to get to here is electronic devices would be issued electronic devices from our system, or the kid using their, their cell phone on a car, I mean, in a bus riding home, and they're using it for something other than an educational purpose. So they're checking the weather for tomorrow or something. I mean, I'm trying to understand. I mean, I think I know what it's about, but I'm trying to find out what was staff's intention with regard to this language. So the, for non-instructional purposes or educational purposes, um, again, it goes back to the school's scope of authority and the portal to portal. So if a student is engaging in the cyberbullying behaviors on the bus and utilizing his or her personal device, that would be for non-instructional or educational purposes. Um, sending text messages that are intended to bring harm to someone or to taunt, mm -hmm. those are the things that we try to encompass within this um, policy to prevent children from doing. So then it's, it's really an effort. Again, we get back to this, this issue of the link to the school day, which, isn't, which, which actually begins before the, the bell rings at a school, or, or when I was a student, before the bell rang at the school, and it extends after the, the last bell when I was a student at the end of a school day. But the school day itself actually continues beyond that. So it includes riding on the bus. And if it includes riding on a bus, does include uh, walking home. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to, this seems, this seems that this could be better written than it is. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying everything has to, you know, I'm just trying to make sure that it isn't, for non-educational purposes, if, it, it, if what the intent was it was supposed to be bad purposes, I get that. But if it says non-educational purposes, I mean, you can't check the weather? Understood. Okay. Um, directing your attention to line 12, and it says, examples of offenses for which the student may be suspended, assigned to an alternative program, and which may result in expulsion. Well, I'll let that go. Um, any other questions with regard to um, page five? Um, just, Mr. Birch, sure. just to dovetail with um, your line of questioning along electronic devices for non-educational purposes during regular instructional hours. We hear a lot about cell phone usage, um, inappropriate or um, non-educational purposes use of cell phones while during class, for instance, or even walking down the hallways, where it's 
disruptive. Um, and I understand also the distinction between riding a bus and you're going to be on the bus for 15, 20 or in, in, out in our rural area. Sometimes it's an hour. So one would say, well, they can use their devices for non-educational purposes while they're on the bus, but they can't be disruptive. So perhaps the <coughs> distinction could be made along those lines. And I do think that we need specificity around personal use or personal use of personal items, specifically cell phones in most cases or many cases. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Virch is right, you know, can the students check the weather while they're riding home on the bus? So it's disruptive versus non-disruptive. Um, and some level of um, discretion, because I know at times teachers may have students use cell phones for educational purposes. So we don't want to hamstring our educators, um, but at the same time, we want to make it clear to students and their parents what's appropriate use, what's inappropriate use. And sometimes it may simply be the teacher in the classroom setting down that that process or saying this is an appropriate time, this is not an appropriate time, and it would go back to category one of listening to, to the authority figure, whether that's the teacher in the classroom or a teacher in the hallway or um, whoever is supervising the cafeteria, for instance. Um, but I do think some more specificity around cell phone use and um, disruptive versus non-educational on the bus ride home may be good because, again, the, for some students, it's a lengthy time, and that may be um, a good way to pass the time. In, in, so I, I agree some more specification would be helpful. Thank you. Um, and if I, if I may just direct staff's attention to um, how Category 2 from Lines 11 on um, our, uh, the outline form is, is set up, we go from run one, uh, small one at line 12 to uh, arson, fire explosives, not having a um, sort of a small uh, letter um, uh, designation. And we have an A and a B, which I guess should be a one and a two. And that's an outline issue for the rest of the category uh, two matters. So if you see what I'm referring to, it's very similar to what we just had before, where these headings are kind of floating in the outline form. Yes, sir. Now, if I could just direct your attention to lines 17 and 18. Well, first, with regard to line 16, it, it, we have this sort of like name, fire alarm hyphen false fire report. And I note that there isn't any punctuation that follows any of these, which could be pretty, which I think is e pretty easily addressed. But I think what's missing there is uh, maybe a gerund form, uh, triggering a fire alarm or tripping a fire alarm, or, or in, in, in some days it was pulling a fire alarm. Uh, but uh, some of them have like a hammer or something. So we need some kind of verb in there, probably in the gerund for form that sort of says, uh, what uh, is going on. And with regard to 17 and 18, possession of an incendiary or explosive material or device, including live ammunition, firecracker or greater. Well, first, let's go back to where it says including. I think it, it, if we're going to use this kind of wording, it's including, comma, but not limited to, comma, live, in for, live ammunition. And then this idea that somehow firecrackers in a parentheses or greater, I mean, I, I th I think we mean something worse than live ammunition, but I think that that's just not clear enough and we need something else in there and maybe less is more, but that just isn't um, uh, enough from what I, from, from as I was reading it. Okay, so just a Go ahead. Um, uh, point of information and I'm sure um, both the, the former principals in the room can expand on this. When uh, suspension or expulsion notices are prepared for students, they are directly tied to <coughs> the category and the particular letter of the offense. So for example, even though the subtitle reads arson slash fire explosives, when a student is suspended or expelled, the category would be a category two A offense for um, tripping a false alarm or giving a false report. So while um, it does, it's not tied to your, uh, your style guide, 
um, there is there is a specific style and a, a method to the madness, if you will. But again, I'll leave that to the former principals to speak to that further. Well, well, I, well I appreciate what, what um, council has said because council has a lot of experience with these matters. The fact is the caboose is, is more what's the form that's used by the principals. It's the policy from which things flow. And if we have policy without punctuation, we have a policy that's supposed to follow an outline form and it doesn't follow an outline form. And this is a school system. We have a lot of very highly educated people that have been doing outlines for a long, long time. And I'm not making too, I'm not trying to make light of it, but I do get it that it means that the form that we're using with our principals needs to adapt to look like the policy. That's just my opinion because it's the policy, it's not the, the caboose. But uh, any other comments with regard to page five? Yes, Kathleen, go ahead. Um, thank you. I was all, also had some general questions around in reviewing these, the categories, category two, um, and understanding that in the past our student behavior incidents and reporting was in the STARS system. Is that correct? You mean when a student engaged in the information is uploaded into the system? Yes. Yes. Okay, so as a, for, as a form of documentation. So is that going to be the same going forward or is that are we going to be shifting that to another platform? It's used in the SIS. So the same information is put in the SIS. So are School we, information, I'm sorry, yes. So are we maintaining two separate but equal informa in, information systems for the students? It's the same system. Okay. But it was previously called STARS, is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. And now it's student information Yes, ma'am. Okay. And as Mr. Virch was speaking, the policy and then we have style but we also have grammar which any of our educators can tell us is very important place a comma differently and it can change the meaning um, how is the SIS set up is it consistent and clear with this or are there also going to be opportunities to align but maybe better align it with the categories so everything is aligned. Um, so once someone goes to put the information in, it's a drop down menu and it's aligned. So they drop down and you can see the host of items and it's lined to the handbook and the principal can just click on whichever the categories are um, that are being addressed through the uh, consequences being levied. Okay, and then how is it handled when there's multiple misbehaviors in one incident? You can select whichever behaviors are appropriate for that incident. Multiple ones, multiple levels, because it could be a category one of this and a category two of that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and those are easily reported out in terms of how our students are doing. Not with identifiable data, personally identifiable data, but as, as a whole. So in terms of school progress plans, if you're trying to reduce altercations between students, principals have the way to track that coming out of the SIS. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. If we could then, moving on to uh, page six, uh, directing um, uh, your attention, Dr. Martin Knox, to um, lines one through three, and it's regarding the use and or possession of tobacco products. The sense I have of the way of what's intended from this, because it appears to be a, a verb missing after the word cigarettes. Use and or possession of tobacco products, tobacco related devices, imitation tobacco products, cigarette rolling paper, or electronic cigarettes repeated offense. I suspect the intention is if a student has, has used or has possession um, of these items and it's more than one time, then they can be subjected to the consequences of a category two offense being that they may be suspended, assigned to an alternative program, and or uh, may be expelled. That's the intent. But uh, I just want to, I see a nodding, so. Yes, sir. You get with me that mm -hmm. it says cigarettes repeated offense. We need somehow to make that clear that that's what's, so that it's worded properly, and of course the punctuation that we talked about earlier. Now, if I could direct your attention to line 15 on page six. I'm sorry, and, and if you need to like write some notes or something, just interrupt me if I'm, if I'm moving too fast or if any of our members are. Okay, you good? Yes, sir. All right, going to line 15. Um, and this is again under this disrespect slash insubordination. Um, 
without getting to those two words, but going down to line 15, participating in and or inciting a school disruption. I think a reasonable person has to ask, what is, what is the definition of disruption? And I guess a principal like your former principal like yourself or uh, Dr. Uh, McComas, you know, knows what disruption means. And I'm just trying to make it clear for folks if, because if someone has to go through a process, an administrative process, then we know what we're talking about when we use the word disruption. Can you give us some examples? Sure, so disruption is any behavior that interferes with the daily operations of a schoolhouse. Um, disruption, just giving you an example, um, let's just say a food fight in a cafeteria. If a student decides to throw a carton of orange juice, um, it will incite others to engage in those same behaviors, and that's one uh, scenario of a school disruption, because it is disrupting the normal scope of the school day. Um, if we have a situation where, um, and it's hard for me to think of one, but I'm trying to think of one in the classroom, um, where a student would flip over a chair or a desk um, and causes the other kids to run from the classroom in fear or what have you, that would be a disruption to the instructional program. Um, so that would be two uh, definitions or examples um, to support the definition of school disruption. Can you think of anything else, Dr. McComas? I was thinking of a stink bomb. <laughs> I've had students- That's incendiary had, device. Had, yeah. You know, a stink bomb in the stairwell you know, I was just trying to think of some of the ones that really pop into my mind as really clearly disruptive to the orderly operation of And trying to determine where it's come from because actually you're pulling administrators from observing instruction, you're stopping teachers from teaching. Those are things that are classified. And I'm glad you said it because I was actually thinking of poppers. Well, I, I thank both of you for those examples, but we had started out our discussion on this policy referencing our students with special needs and a child with a special need that may flip over a chair while in the normal course of events we may be able to infer some kind of intent from the child's action. A child with a special need flipping over a chair, that may or may not be an, uh, an event, notwithstanding what may occur in the classroom, that warrants a child to be suspended, assigned to an alternative program, and or expulsion. So that is why we need to have the discretion and we assume that the person who's been appointed to be the principal in a school is a person with that reasoned uh, sense of what is oriented to the specific student's behavior. Is that, I see you nodding. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, do any other members have any questions with regard to uh, page six? Yes. Going back actually to page five on um, page five under paragraph B, ca category two, and it goes down and the heading is attacks, threats, fighting. So uh, the third one, the second one is physical attacks on a student, and the third one is threats on an individual. But where, where, where is the protection for staff? They actually um, rise to the level of a category three. Okay, so that's. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, back to page six, if I could. If I could just direct your attention to line 18. Um, the words that we use clearly have meaning. Um, in Q, it says, inappropriate behavior of a sexual nature. Um, if you had to dis say to a principal, what's inappropriate, if you had to say to one of our principals, the following is inappropriate behavior of a sexual nature. Does it involve a touching? Does it involve, uh, a, you know, a verbal eye? What, what is that? So it, any behavior, um, and not to be redundant, of a sexual nature, it could be touching. Um, when someone does not want to be touched, and they shouldn't be touched, because they're still children, but anyone who does not want to be touched, or um, someone who's touching someone in an inappro inappropriate manner, um, without getting into the specifics of body parts, just touching. Oh, I hear you, I hear you. But I mean, um, it just seems that there's, so, there's such a wide range of behavior, and what's the arbiter of inappropriate? 
or who is the arbiter of inappropriate? Obviously, it's the principal there. So what, what if any guidelines do we give them for what's inappropriate? And I know there's a common sense standard that someone might utilize. I'm just trying to, under, to get a sense. So uh, again, putting on my principal's mm -hmm. hat, it, you don't touch anyone anywhere. And so that's the bottom line. Um, if you are touching someone and they have not uh, invited you to touch, it's inappropriate. Um, and this is discussed with principals when they do handbook talks because it's in the handbook, so it's done in the beginning of the year as well as in the middle of the year. And we also oftentimes use our SROs to explicitly share uh, what could occur if uh, they did it outside of the scope of the school house. So again, everything that's in here is trying to teach our children that what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, and so any imp inappropriate behavior, it could be a kiss on the cheek. If I've not invited you to kiss me on the cheek, then you should not be kissing me on the cheek, which would be inappropriate behavior of a sexual nature. So a kid holds up an image from their device, and it's an image that's in the, uh, in the nudes from the Louvre. Is that an inappropriate behavior of a sexual nature? With the child's intent of showing and displaying, knowing it's an, yes, sir. So, and then it doesn't matter whether it's from the Louvre or whether it's from some, some site that the child's not, or the student's not supposed to be going on um, because, uh, or with a device. And that would be an inappropriate use of their device, so they'd be violating More than one. communications. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Go ahead. I would like to add that um, the inappropriate um, behavior of a sexual nature could also be comments. Right, mm -hmm. it could extend beyond a physical uh, experience. Any other uh, questions with regard to uh, page six? <sighs> Let me just ask you, if taking up the line six there, where it says conspiracy or planning between two or more persons to commit a category three offense. What if any instruction do our, do our principals have with regard to conspiracy? When they begin to conduct their investigation and they see that there was planning that has taken place, um, they know that the conspiracy has also, when there's more than one and they've come together to deliberately or with deliberate intent to bring harm to anyone um, or to violate a category three, usually it comes through um, from the investigative process or providing students with due process. So, uh, and, and, and I do understand the method behind the mandis, but the heading is disrespect slash insubordination. So if two or more students are talking about um, calling the principal a name, which in the normal course of events is considered a, a, a pejorative term, um, that the, the kids would be guilty of conspiring even though they don't do it. And they could be punished to such an extent that they could be suspended, assigned to an alternative program, and or expelled. If the conspiracy is to commit a category three. Well, I mean, I'm reading from category two, and that's what the line is under uh, page, uh, page six, line six. Conspiracy, oh, I, I got you, okay. Conspiracy or planning between two or more persons to commit a category three, uh, three offense. But why is it head under the heading of disrespect or insubordination? That's when we can go back and have a conversation to make sure that it's appropriately um, aligned. Um, these are actually aligned uh, by the handbook committee, and so that is a conversation that we can take back and make sure that it is appropriately placed. Okay. Or to make sure that it's not already appropriately placed. Any other questions with regard to uh, page six? All right, we'll move on to page uh, seven. I know we have David's comment uh, down there at the bottom. Uh, and I had written in my notes a very similar line, intended to be mandatory, where's the mandatory language? Um, do any of our uh, uh, committee members have any questions with regard to page seven? Very good. Well, then that's uh, policy 5550.
regard to page 55, or rather page one of page uh, policy 5560, uh, Dr. Martin Knox, you're doing a very, very good job. I appreciate your attentiveness. Uh, do any of the, uh, the committee members have any questions with regard to page one of policy 5560? Um, seeing none, we'll move to page two. With regard to page two, line 23, if you could just brief, and, and take, you, if you take a moment to read it, the exclusion of a student from a student's regular program, this is the definition, I guess, of extended suspension, the exclusion of a student from a student's regular program for a time period between 11 and 45 days, which only may occur under the following circumstances. What I wanted to ask you is, could you please explain what, what's, what makes the difference between expulsion and extended suspension since both use um, this uh, imminent threat of serious harm language? So at the schoolhouse, a principal can suspend a child up to 10 days. Anything beyond the scope of 10 days, the principal or the administrator uh, makes the determination of uh, suspending the child to the superintendent's designee. Um, and at that time, the superintendent's designee um, can um, uh, suspend the child for up to four, 11 to 45 days. Um, so it's an extended suspension beyond the scope of a principal's ability to suspend a child up to 10 days. Um, so the superintendent's designees actually take the information um, and they review the information that's being brought uh, to the hearing to make the determination of the appropriate time frame and the appropriate placement for the said behaviors. Right, uh, and maybe, I'm, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought it read expulsion and extended suspension. So what's the difference between expulsion and extended suspension? So an expulsion is at 45 days and more. An extended suspension is less than 45. Okay. Chuck uh, Halima? Kathleen, um, go ahead, Chuck. No, I, I, um, I apologize if this was discussed before, but I um, was a little concerned about whether imminent was necessary to have in there. Did you discuss um, uh, it, um, imminent implies, you know, an immediate threat. Um, but if there's a threat that may not take place immediately, but there's still a threat, would, would we lose anything by removing imminent from the policy? I would have to go back and look. I do believe this language is aligned to Comar. Okay. All right. Uh, that, that, that was just my, that, on uh, page two, that was my only question. Halima? Um, I do have a kind of question about what happens. Here. Yeah. When a student is um, suspended for 11 to 45 days or more, what is an example of that? Like, um, what can cause a student to be suspended for 11 to 45 days or more? So, what can cause a student to be suspended for that long, depending upon the behaviors mm -hmm. and the violations of category three offenses, um, the disruption to the schoolhouse, or the uh, intent to harm others or himself or herself. Um, it depends on the behavior. Um, and again, it goes to the superintendent's designee and all the content of the behaviors or the incident are considered before the determination is made. But usually it's the violations of category three offense. So then when, it's, um, when we talk about making up work or um, we're doing a quarter, because that's about a month, 45 days or more is like about moving to a month or two. Are they giving this same opportunity in a sense, such as like a college student misses a semester or something like, do they have the opportunity to make up the work or is it one of those because you missed, because you did this, you missed this many days, you eventually have to face the consequences of what you did? 
and what happens? So that's a good question. S students are always receiving education. Um, so they do receive their work so that they're not missing the educational opportunities that they are, that they deserve. If I could just follow up on Halima's question, and if Kathleen has a question, I'll get to her in just a moment, but uh, it's relevant because of what Halima asked. Going to line, line 17, and it says the school system provides the excluded student, so this is a student that's been expelled, with comparable educational services and appropriate behavioral support services to promote successful return to the student's regular school program. Questions I want to ask you is this. The goal then, if a student's expelled, the goal is to get the student back in school. Is that, is that right? That's correct. And that's notwithstanding the fact that the student may have been expelled because of an imminent threat earlier. Because the student would have been provided with behavioral supports, they could learn more about this and understand uh, what's going on. I see you nodding. Is that, is that, is that sort of the sense? That's correct. Okay. Now, I think what Chuck was, was, was getting to was the issue of imminent. Is there any criteria that, because you know, he suggested maybe doing away with it and just using immediate, is there any criteria that we use to gauge imminent? I mean, there may, maybe there's some case law that says here's an imminent, I mean, here's an example of imminent. But I'm just trying, what, 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 do, we, what do we share with our principals? Yeah. I mean, the Comar language would pose an imminent threat of serious harm to other students or staff. So, yeah, it's in Comar, but as a practical matter, in a school with a principal, um, and well, who I suspect is on the phone to people like the executive director and your, and or yourself or another community, su or a scoop community superintendent, what, if you could, if you could just take us very briefly through what would happen to determine that that imminent threat level's been met. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming it's imminent threat of, you know, of harm, and so the, you know, maybe law enforcement's engaged here. I mean, um, how, does that, how does that work? So one of the things that um, we participate in to help a child, because everything we do is about he helping children, is a threat assessment. And our school support staff, uh, the social worker, the psychologist, um, they're all trained to determine whether this child is or is not a threat to himself or others. So a threat assessment is um, implemented uh, to gauge a child's thinking. Um, when the um, threat assessment is concluded, that information information is then used to determine, going back to earlier, um, with the principal, if this child needs to be suspended to the superintendent's designee, um, or if a child even has an IEP that says uh, his or her behaviors should be addressed in a particular way because it is a manifestation of his disability. Um, that's where that language comes into play. So we put a lot of supports in place um, to determine whether a child is a direct threat to himself or others. Um, so that's the immediacy that you hear in the language of imminent. And the threat assessment, and, I, and if I'm taking this too, too, too detailed of a level, as a practical matter, let me know. Do we have criteria for a imminent threat assessment? That, that we use? Is there like established criteria? Yes, sir. And that's a document, that's a form that, that we use that principals have on their desk or? So principals don't do threat assessments unless they've been trained to do so. And I have people behind me who can walk through the and I process. I see them not. Please come up. Please come They're up. They're whispering. They yeah. don't know I hear them. <laughs> but as a former music teacher, I hear everything. Um, so uh, Dr. Bennett or Ms. Mustafa or Dr. Brinkley Parker. So it's while they're coming up, it's not a checklist for principals. It's actually no, don't, don't, no. You can stay here. So it's not a checklist. It's it's a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face dialogue with the child, with a professional, to determine his or her uh, thinking capacity at that particular point in time. A threat or behaviors are noted. Uh, so Ms. Mustafers to my right, and Dr. Brinkley Parker's to my left, and they'll go into s more specifics regarding a threat assessment. I'm not sure if you want to go first. No. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the most recent uh, definition through state regulation in terms of imminent threat and how we're using that language in order to help our um, 
clinicians to understand when they go into schools to do the threat assessment. So it is defined um, through the Maryland Public Schools document that imminent threat of serious harm is likely an immediate danger of significant physical injury, the inability of a child to de-escalate after an intervention and return to the classroom without continuing the physical attack on either staff or students would constitute an imminent threat. And so Ms. Mustafer will now go into details um, regarding a threat assessment and what it looks like, if that's okay with you. When a student poses a threat and it's reported to a staff member, um, typically that is directly reported to a school administrator, at which time they make a decision about who is the person that has the closest relationship with that student. And it may not, you know, somebody may not have a direct relationship at that point, but they do identify a host of, or an individual um, within their team of support staff um, who comprises of the school counselor, uh, it could be a teacher that's available as well, um, school social worker, if that person is assigned to the school, the school psychologist, um, it could be the school resource officer as well. But this is a team of individuals who are trained to conduct threat assessments. And at that time, what they do is they consider what has been presented. And they, there is a decision made in consultation with school leadership as to who is going to work with that student to identify, is this a threat? And when we look at threats, we have three levels of threats. Um, and so we're looking at that to see, does the student actually have a plan? Um, do they have a method to execute the, the plan? And do they have a means um, to um, follow through on that plan? So that's really what we're considering when we're looking at our threat assessment process um, and, and going through that with our staff. We do formal training on that every year. Once that process um, has rendered a decision, we do take that back to the team and keep in mind the student is never left alone in this process. They're always with an adult. Um, and that information is taken back and shared because one of the things that we know about our students is if you're talking about imminent threat, depending on how serious it is, it also uh, may prompt a response that um, could call upon us to look at emergency psychiatric services, emergency responder services. So we have to be able to take a look at what level of threat um, the student poses and uh, provide resources to secure their safety and the safety of others uh, within the schoolhouse and on school grounds at all times. I very much appreciate you taking the time to explain that and I very much appreciate that additional clarifying language that you mentioned. Would staff based on our discussion this evening, would staff have any difficulty adding that language to the section that uses the term imminent threat to include but not limited to and then use that language? We'll take it back and yes, sir, we'll look at that. Very good, thank you. Yeah, and I do want to ask your colleagues on a, on a practical basis, outside of the uh, what would be a misalignment with COMAR and maybe some state standards, what concerns would you have about taking out imminent? I mean, what, on a practical basis, what, what kind of um, issues would arise if, if that word were not in our uh, board policy? We'll just take it back and have the conversation just to make sure what we've put in our policies are reflective of what is indicated under COMAR um, because a lot of the information that's here is aligned to COMAR. So we'll, we'll definitely have a discussion about uh, the removal or the uh, keeping or maintaining imminent within Thank our policy. Thank you. Don't leave. <laughs> Kathleen, you've been very patient. Go right ahead. Thank you. Ms. Mustafer, when you were outlining the different types of support staff that would be available to do a threat assessment, is the school nurse ever involved in those? The school nurse is involved. So um, we do consult with them frequently and um, sometimes depending on if there's an injury even prior to um, the need to assess for imminent threat or for threat period to self or others. Um, many times our school nurses are called on immediately so they're responding to the physical component. Um, and then alerting the administrator and then um, your other support staff are consulted and identified to serve. Okay, that's great because we know unfortunately a lot of times there's also maybe a mental health component and then self-harm is also a very um, grave issue that needs to be addressed because it 
it may swing from harming others to self-harm and, mm -hmm. and an imminent threat to others may translate or transition in into imminent threat to self. So involving the school nurse is absolutely um, something that I would look to. So thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. And what I've also done is, um, I don't know if you've met Dr. Bennett. She is the coordinator of our school psychologists. Um, and so she also has additional information that she can communicate it, that communicate beyond uh, what Ms. Mustafer has uh, done so far as well. Sure, good evening, excuse my voice. Um, in addition, I just wanted to kind of clarify because for a threat, we refer to it as threat management process rather than threat assessment because sometimes threat assessment gives the uh, false idea that there are going to be some numbers or concrete results um, in terms of measurement. So when we look, when we keep it aligned with what um, the Office of School Safety uh, refers to, it is a threat management process. And I'm glad you brought up the, the question about the nurses. There are a number of professionals who are involved in terms of on a consultation basis, but technically our uh, mental health providers as uh, defined by COMAR are those who take the lead with the process. So that is the social workers, the school psychologists, and the counselors, because they are equipped to um, take a big pick, a, a look at the student from that perspective and understanding what goes into those mental health aspects. But part of their um, management of the process does involve further consultation and bringing in other professionals, but the mental health providers are who, um, that's, the, that's the group who's charged with taking the lead with managing the process and then taking the, informa the information back to school-based leaders who are tasked with actually determining the level of threat based on the input that was given. Kathleen, do you have any other questions? So I really appreciate that clarification because the threat management process uh, does seem to entail what's happening. There is a threat, obviously, so threat assessment and not giving it a number um, is appropriate also. So when a threat management process is involved and then it would go back to the um, administrators to decide is this incident category one, two, three, um, how is that, how is that managed? Is that a conversation that happens? It's a meeting that's happening right then and there? Mm -hmm. Is it? I mean, how, how exactly does that transpire? Yes, we actually um, facilitated a training with all of the mental health providers um, in August of this year to revisit the threat management process and talk about uh, the urgency and the immediacy of response. So when there's a threat situation, uh, typically the school-based administrator is already, they're made aware, like that's inherent in the process, that they are aware that this is going on. And they're usually the ones who kind contact one of the mental health uh, providers to say, I need you to act in this manner and respond in this manner. So once the mental health providers have consulted with the necessary professionals and they come up with impressions or next steps, they are then to communicate with the school-based um, administrator to say, here's what I have found, here are my impressions at this time, here's what I would suggest in terms of next steps for supporting this student. And based on all of that information, whether it's a record review, meeting with the student, um, getting an uh, understanding of the actual situation and the threat that was posed versus the threat that was made, the administrator's um, responsibility is to then determine the level of threat. Yeah, Chuck. I just th thought of an example, and this might not be a good <coughs> example, but it's just one of the thoughts that passed through my head. Um, and we, it was a recent mass shooting in California, and the young man involved, or who's been charged, was assessed at a certain point in time by some mental health people, and it was determined he did not pose and I would say an immediate threat perhaps to his own health or whatever, but I don't know if this word imminent or immediate were not applied, if, he, if, the, if the assessment was could he ever, you know, uh, pose a, you know, you might have a different decision. So whether that's a good example or not, but sometimes <coughs> the word immediate or uh, imminent might cause a different 
decision to be made, and I just think we ought to think about when, when the severity is high, whether that word needs to be there or not. So that was just. Thank you. Thank you. And imminent's the, is the word that's used in Comar, imminent. Yes, sir. Got it, okay. So it's usually both um, because you're having the conversation with the child and, and a part of the due process is to have him or her write whatever it is that has been communicated. The other piece to the question that you've posed um, that the student would receive oral or written, um, we ask our principals to make sure that principals, I mean that parents always receive written notification of his or her suspension. So then there would be no inherent problem with making this clear that it's supposed to be both oral and written notice of the charges and the opportunity to respond in writing uh, orally and and in writing there would be no issue with including that no sir okay yes please are you on are you on the top of page five dealing with letter E uh, in fact I am and, and I reference line six seven and eight okay because the Starting with E, and, and I appreciate where you're going with that, it says students shall receive, but I think there needs to be specific of when does the parent receive. Well, I, I, hear you, and I, think I think I hear you, and I think part of the concern is this, the parent, the due process focuses on the child, and clearly the parent, you know, uh, is part of that. And I, I, I think as this is worded, and staff can certainly look at this, if the, assuming the parent becomes engaged in the student's due process, then there is that transmission or communication. I think that's what Dr. Martin Knox was referring to. If you want to just explain that for, for Ms. Causey. So um, this is about the student, but I also need to add another piece. So um, with your recommendation of receive oral and, or written, um, I would ask if and or written because we have some students who are nonverbal um, or we have students who have limited writing due to a disability. They may not be able to write. So the or is there, but. Well, I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to get to the due process part. So the principal talks to the student who is able to, you know, hear, is not deaf, mm -hmm. and or is not hearing impaired, and, uh, and the, the principal says whatever, and then the student is relied upon to go back to mom, dad, or the guardian and say, here's what the principal told me, as opposed to having something that is a, re is a written record, which is given to the student, the student then takes. So that's why my issue is with or, because it suggests you can do either one and be okay, but if we want to have and I see you're saying and or because if we have a hearing impaired student, then the oral piece isn't going to meet, but everybody's going to get a written notice. So everyone's going to get a written okay. notice to their, for their parents. And there's also a communications that take pl takes place from the administrator to the parent as well. So they would receive both. And papers. a record to document the due process because it's in writing. Yes, sir. Gotcha. So if that's how that can be worded, I get that. I, I, I mean, I think it's good to explain to the student if, it, if you can do that. But I think the, the written piece is the required piece. Kathleen, go ahead. I agree 
I agree with you. The written piece is a required piece, and I would even go further and specify that the parent should receive an email, and then depending on, um, because that's how we are setting up our system to work, if we have parents that do not receive emails, and I assume we do have some, then it would be in the manner in which they are set up to receive their student information. I mean, if you have a student that for some reason has gotten into trouble and they want to delay the, the imminent of telling their parents or whatever, that parent should be receiving in as soon as possible the notification of what's going on. So that's why they usually, that's why I said earlier, they usually get a phone call mm -hmm. in addition to because sometimes the letters that are given to the kids don't make it. Mm -hmm. So if they, um, the parents receive a phone call, the administrators typically make a phone call to the parent to explain what has occurred as well. Right, but in, in the due process portion of it, what's in writing is going to be clear, consistent, reliable. It's not going to be a he, he said, she said in the heat of a moment, a parent hearing something about their student misconstrues or misunderstands. Do you see what I'm saying? So are you referring to the suspension notification or are you referring to the written document that has been provided to the administrators regarding the incident from the student's perspective? Well, whichever would be the most significant for the parent to have if they are going to then um, try and appeal or try and clarify with the administrator about what's happening to their student. So that's the letter, the letter, the notification. The notification of suspension is actually what it's called. Um, the parents receive that in addition to a phone call regarding the incident that has occurred. Okay, and where would that be clarified in the policy in terms of parent communication? Because we see this, we see the student part. So, so well, if, if I might just interrupt everybody, just direct your attention to page 6, lines 12 to 14. <coughs> if we were looking for a place, the principal or school administrator shall promptly contact the parent of a student suspended or expelled under this paragraph. I mean, I'm not saying it's complete, but I'm saying if we had to place something someplace, that might be the place. So that would be the place um, where the principal school administrator shall promptly contact the parent of a student suspended or expelled under this paragraph with follow-up in writing. Something along those lines. I see Mr. Virch and Mr. McDaniel shaking their head. There's a Nod distinction between nod and shake. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> nodding. <laughs> I'm optimistic about everything. Um, anything further with regard to uh, page uh, five? And if, and if we could, moving to page six, uh, directing your attention to line one. Uh, actually, it begins to, to it's, it's part of B from page five uh, about the prohibition. Um, and it reads, expelled from school if required by federal law. And I'm wondering if, um, if required or permitted by federal law would be, would be better, and I'd ask Ms. Howie that question. The question arises under the Gun-Free Schools Act, and, and I had um, a bit of a, um, a round of conversation with someone from the Public Interest Law Center, uh, very sincere in their position, as to whether the, f the, um, the federal uh, gun safe school, there you go, uh, and, uh, whether that act requires or permits. And if someone brings a school, brings a gun rather, to school, for us that's a mandatory expulsion. And the question was whether the federal act requires that 
or permits it, meaning it creates an exception to expel a student for that. Because otherwise, kindergarten kids aren't supposed to be, <laughs> but they bring a gun to school and it's, it's a mandatory. So that's why I said uh, if required or permitted by federal law, just to be, just to be clear. And I had my notes about contact with parents, and we've previously discussed that. Um, Chuck or Halima, do you, either of you have any questions with regard to page six? Kathleen. Kathleen, do you have any questions with regard to page six? Okay. Um, anything with regard to um, seven, eight, or nine? And I would note there will be a policy review committee after tonight's meeting, so they can pick up on the remaining pages. Chuck Halima, are you good? Yes. yes. Kathleen, uh, take your time, and if there's a question that you have with regard to the remainder of 5560, uh, this, we have the folks here, and uh, we want to make sure that you have a question, you have that opportunity. Excuse me, <clears throat> that's Good. page 12 at the top, paragraph C. It relates to a student who has been um, suspended or expelled from the school, but then comes back to the school premises. And I am just curious why we would not include under C that um, the student, if they enter the school premises during this period, the student will be removed and the police shall be notified. Um, because if they're there when they're not supposed to be there, in some of these cases, it's potentially dangerous. If I might so just point out, we... isn't that a trespass? Yes, sir. I mean. Just to clarify to the students and parents that it's not just, oh, they're coming and we're just gonna nicely ask them to leave. If they're coming to school grounds, when they are under suspension or expulsion, there's a strong reason why they're not supposed to be there. On the notifications that go home, it's also indicated on there as well that the student should not be at the school because they can't participate in any activity. So it is in the notification that parents receive that a child should not be on the premises during the time of the suspension. So is the misdemeanor that's referenced as Mr. Birch says a trespass? Yes, ma'am. So maybe that needs to be spelled out that it's trespass. And then the school administrator would have well. their discretion to utilize the SRO as necessary and the students and parents would understand that trespassing is a crime. Does that make sense? Well, the issue is that we have an A and a B on the prior page, and A speaks to the trespass, but um, uh, part of A speaks to the trespass, but the second part is a school-sponsored activity. So let's say the school has a, let's say you're, you're, you've been expelled from high school, and the night that, or the day that you're expelled, that evening there is a, uh, a school-sponsored event over at uh, the community college swimming pool. So it's not a, a, a trespass to be over at the community college swimming pool, but it is illegal for you to, it's a misdemeanor for you to be at a place where there's a school-sponsored activity. And the school-sponsored activity would be being over at the swimming pool at the community college. So it's both, so there's the trespass if you're on school property, board property, and then there's the school-sponsored activity piece, which is you're not supposed to be present. 
uh, or participating. And that's what's on the form that goes back to them. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the form, the form reads as it reads now. I yes, got sir. It. Okay. And if we had somebody who, who wasn't a student, but somebody who walked onto one of our schools, you know, school grounds, and they weren't supposed to be inside, they, they would be where they're not supposed to be, and whatever they, they do, they do. Okay. Any other thing with regard to 5516? And it's also possible that, you know, my colleagues may think of something else that they can bring to your attention after this meeting. Is that right? I'm sorry, say that again. It's also possible that we may think of something as we're driving home tonight. Uh, my gosh, I forgot to ask about. Then we can certainly include you in an email with and CC our fellow board member, I mean, our fellow our board members or committee members. That's correct. Right, okay. Anything further with regard to this policy? Well, thank you so much for your thoroughness. Uh, the last item, and we're, we were just about at 6.30, we are at 6.30, which is when things end. Uh, the last item was with regard to uh, uh, an environmental matter at uh, the uh, Parkville Middle School. And I want to thank our presenters. Uh, thank you so much. But if we could just have some folks from staff come up briefly for uh, Mr. Birch, Yes. Excuse me, before you move on, I just had a question related to information that was given to us in the binder before. Sure. Um, and there was um, tab. 21 that was labeled um, feedback discipline policy work groups and it's empty so was there a section that was supposed to be given to us but was not or is that something that's pending no ma'am that is pending Good. okay so is there an estimate time frame of when PRC would receive that? So we've had um, two meetings and moving into a third. So I can definitely provide you with information regarding those sessions. But um, as we get the recommendations, we were going to create one fluid document after we've met. Um, but we have several more meetings to go. Okay. And I guess when I was reviewing in public comment and there was some in there from um, some of our folks from TABCO about the um, DOG. So are, I was thinking that some of that information would be under this tab and my understanding is that's been ongoing for a year. So DOG, um, Dr. Adams, you would you please? <laughs> Well, I was just at the TABCO 100th anniversary uh, <coughs> celebration, which was wonderful, and so it reminded me, that was on Friday, so it reminded me, you know, they always want to be seated at the table, and then I noticed that there was... Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. So last year, Dr. McComas, myself, um, some of the community superintendents, and Dr. Wistead met with the TABCO Discipline Action Work Group. They call themselves DOG. Um, we had several meetings with them. Um, during the course of that meeting, several... Um, different action items were spun out of that meeting. Um, however, we did not formulate as a group recommendations. So let me tell you what spun out of that meeting. As I recall, I don't have my notes in front of me, <laughs> but going off the top of my head. Um, we, uh, so Dr. Mar Dr. Knox and her, DeMart Knox and her team are picking up those conversations with, this, with that work group this year. Um, TABCO and those members asked to be represented on different work groups that Ms. Mustafer and Dr. Brinkley Parker are on in terms of um, our comprehensive plan to making sure every, every school has a discipline plan and things like that. And so they were um, invited and participated and do participate in the creation of those documents and which then drive professional learning for schools. And we had lots of conversations about discipline in schools, about um, but not necessarily about, we did not have conversations about specific recommendations for the board to revise policy. Um, we talked, for example, about cell phone use. Um, and we talked about um, what is in policy versus the fact that most, I believe all secondary schools have cell phone policies and procedures in place. My children went to two different middle schools and two different high schools and the rules came home with a summer packet and told you when you could use your phone and under what purposes. And so I don't want the board to believe that um, out of the work we did last year, there were recommendations that were made that you have not received. There were not specific discipline recommendations that were made. We came to a space, I believe, with that group where we thought we need continued supports and professional learning about what was in place. For example, the more we talked about 
inappropriate cell phone use, the more we came to consensus that there are things currently in the handbook that align to different instances of inappropriate use, for example, of cell phones and things like that. So it wasn't that there wasn't um, the ability to render consequences around that behavior, is that there may not have always been the communication around what aligns to what in our current policy rules and procedures. Dr. Adams, thank you for taking a moment to update my committee colleague on that matter. Absolutely. And it's a, it, to the extent there are board, the recommendations for board with regard to policy, and if there's something else that you'd like to share, you certainly can. I don't want to belabor it. I just wanted to, Very good. I didn't want you all to believe that there was something that we had that you, we had not provided to you. And I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. Now, we do have this last item on the agenda. We're just a little behind schedule. Thank you. Um, and if we can just uh, move to uh, our Parkville Middle School, which is in our sixth district. Um, a lot of good things going on at the school. And um, with us is Pete Dixit from our facilities and the community superintendent, um, Dr. or Ms? Miss. Ms. Uh, Byers. Still working on <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm here to update the committee on some of the environmental concerns that we have been talking about. Uh, just want to draw your attention to board policy 2372, which addresses a healthy learning environment, and uh, s some of our environmental issues are guided by that. Uh, there have been a lot of talk about mold. While there are no open mold environmental issues at this time, there have been concerns, there have been issues, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. In all cases, when the mold was reported to us, immediate action was taken. So I want to assure the board that our protocol has two steps. The first step is that anytime we see mold, or for that matter, any environmental issue affecting health of uh, students and faculty, it has to be immediately reported. Once it is reported, we start, we initiate action right away. In case of mold, two parts of the protocol are, if it is minor, limited to some spaces, building st staff has been trained uh, to remove that under the guidance of licensed professionals. We have a active environmental staff and the minute we find out there is any mold issue, the building staff is trained using the material uh, that is approved by EPA to remove it. If it is persistent, if it is aggressive in nature, as it did happen in a couple of schools, we have services of the board approved um, a contractor that is immediately called and, uh, and, and uses uh, additional chemicals that are again EPA approved and we make, make sure that anything that we use, uh, it does not hurt the health of children or occupants of the building. So we take care of that when, when, it is, um, when it is persistent and aggressive. And as a background to the board, mold spores are all over the place. So it's not that mold spores are not present. It just takes that particular environment, which is combination of humidity, uh, lighting, um, air conditioning, cold air. Air conditioning and humidity are not the best friends for us because when, when they combine, if they are not managed properly, it may result in mold. And that's what happened in some cases. Uh, the, uh, there is no one set of formula that we can tell it this is what is going to cause it. It could be introduction of humid air from open door. It could be introduction of humid air from a crawl space that has not been sealed. It could be introduction of open uh, uh, humid air through some mechanical system part that didn't work or just the malfunctioning of control. So there is no one formula to find the cause, root cause if and uh, and take care of it. So what we have to do is clean the mold immediately and then look for the cause, which takes some time in some cases. In some cases, it, it is evident that this window was left open and that's what caused it. In some cases, it could be a little hole someplace that we really, really have to look for it. And we actively try to do that. Um, 
as you know, this was the wettest, uh, uh, last two, three months were the wettest month in the history of the you know, country ever since they started keeping record. That combined with tremendous increase in number of air condi conditioned school. So that m maybe that is one of the reason that is attributed to it. We are in the process of adjusting to new culture of humid conditions and air conditioned building. And just the whole set of operating culture is being adjusted to handle it better. Uh, specifically, we, you have heard about Parkville Middle School. Uh, there were humidity issues throughout the building that resulted in regular and sporadic environment concerns. They were addressed daily. We were in contact with the school administration. I've been in contact with the community superintendent, Ms. Byers here, and together we knew exactly where we are going and principal was talking to students, uh, teachers, parents as needed, and at this time, all of that is under control. So just uh, most of the uh, mold there was in the uh, locker room area. You know, that, that area for some reason was impacted quite a bit. Um, our general record for indoor air quality uh, has been uh, excellent. There have been EPA awards in 2006, 2007, 2010, and we have gotten awards from American Lung Association for good quality of air and a national mentorship award in 2010. So we have qualified licensed staff taking care of those issues. And at this time, if you have any questions, um, I'd be more than glad to answer. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, my understanding is about 40% or so, maybe 80% of our buildings are 40 years or older. Yeah. And Parkville Middle School was one of those schools that uh, opened in like the late 50s, or maybe the early 50s, in fact. Yeah. And in those days, you had two things. You had, you would heat your building, and you would have natural ventilation. And natural ventilation, does that mean open the windows? That was pretty much, yeah. and, you had, and of course you had the flat roof. Yeah. And as we move along, uh, we become more conscious about uh, the issue of, of saving energy. So we begin to seal our buildings, um, buildings that currently, that, 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 that then existed. And as we seal them, where moisture goes, how it gets out, how it gets in, et cetera, uh, if it's inside the building, it's more difficult for it to get out. Is, is, is that right? And at the same time, we're now sealing buildings. We now have a host of regulations that are building codes, and they're oriented to ventilation. And then the question becomes, what mechanism can you use to best meet ventilation building codes? Is that right? That's right. And if you take a look at window air conditioners, they don't really allow you to control for humidity. And if you go with, uh, say, big box uh, air movers, air movers, maybe you can do like a library, or maybe you can do like a cafeteria, uh, but you can't do like the whole gym. And that doesn't really afford you the opportunity to control humidity throughout the school. Yet you still have the school that's increasingly aging, and it was originally built for being heated or to open up a window. So then that leaves you with air conditioning, um, uh, central air, and in the course of doing that, through the use of controls, you can then begin to manipulate the humidity, but you have to get it, you have to get it right through constant monitoring. And that doesn't mean every time the sun comes out, the building doesn't expand, and I see you nodding, and every time the, build, the sun goes down, the building contracts, which then means that things can open up and close and, and uh, coupled with whatever. So the question I want to have for you is this, how did we communicate with our parents about um, the remedial actions that were being taken? Well, we communicate with the principal. Principal is the focal mm -hmm. point of our communication. We help them in getting information that they need from us, and then principal is in communications with parents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Go ahead, right. So, um, the principal 
would speak with individual parents as concerns arise as needed. And then there was communication that went to the community once everything had been remedied to keep them abreast and to let them know that at this point in time, everything's been remedied and there currently are no environmental issues. I do want to commend you for a couple of good points that you made. When you are building a new building, it is always perfect to have the right air conditioning system and the right heating system, uh, perfect uh, humidity control. Whenever we are doing central air conditioning in a 50-year-old building, we can never compete as good as with a new building. We are doing much better than window air conditioners because had we put in the window air conditioners, the situation would have been even worse. This one allowed us to control the humidity much better by having a cent well-designed central air conditioning system. But still, we cannot match it like we did for the new building. So I just wanted you to know that. That's so generous of you to say. I used to sell paint, and people would, would, would complain about having to buy trim paint yeah. for the outside of their, of their um, plastic siding or aluminum siding enclosed house or a brick house, and the only way the moisture was going to get out was through the windows. And that's why I had to keep painting the trim. So I've, so I've, so I've had this ongoing relationship with humidity, and I, and I am from Baltimore, a Baltimore native, so I know what humidity is about. Now, we've talked about communication with our families, with our, you know, with, with our families who have kids at, at our Parkville Middle School. The communication with staff in our schools, that's, a, that's something that the principal handles. I see you nodding. Correct, and it was ongoing at the time. Um, and through, sometimes it would be a face-to-face -face faculty meeting. Mm -hmm. Other times, as there were developments, it was through email. So as um, things were addressed, then working with Pete's office, he would provide information to the administration, and then the administration could communicate that to staff. I gotcha. And when when dehumidifiers are are I, mean, I have a dehumidifier in our basement, but when dehumidifiers are used in one of our schools, I mean folks see the dehumidifiers in the school, and the fact that dehumidifiers might appear in a school, I mean Villa Cresta is a school that has dehumidifiers in it right now. Yes, it's also a school that I think was opened in the early 50s, yes. and it's also a brick school, and it's also an air conditioned school. Yeah, dehumidif mm -hmm. dehumidifier is used when you have excessive humidity, mm -hmm. and it just supports, it is additional support to the existing air conditioning system. So anytime, the first thing we can do to prevent mold is take the humidity out of school building and any, use any means that you can. So we adjust the temperatures first, of the temperature of the supply air, and uh, if that doesn't work, then we add the dehumidification uh, whenever we can do that. And is that part of the protocol that you follow when there are reports of mold in a building? That's true. Very good. Uh, Halima, do you have any questions with regard to, uh, Kathleen, do you have any questions? Sure. Yes. So I guess my concern is the timing of communications to parents because there are some students that have um, greater illnesses related to mold than others. But how would the staff or the principal know that? So that my concern is when was the mass communication to all the families that there were evidence of mold in the building? So mass communication did not go out to all families until um, the situation had been remedied. And students who have sensitivity, that communication is primarily handled actually through our school nurse and the principal with individual cases depending on the individual student. So what amount of time was the mold being remediated before all of the parents were notified? So once, so one, um, communication went home at the end of last week. So. I don't, I don't know the exact time frame in between. I don't want to speak to that. But I can say there were regular communications. There were any individual time, parents, in, Individual right? parents, there were regular communication. Also, in response to your previous question, whenever there is a health issue, our health office, uh, the, our environmental office and health office work closely. So it's not that we are not communicating. If there's any student-related issue, health office is informed and they work with the student. Right. If there's any employee-related issue, we work with the uh, department HR. 
they work with. So the, the communication is multi-pronged, de depending on the issue that we are handling. Well, going again back to the concern, it, parents may not know their students have an issue with mold until they're in a situation with a lot of mold. So to say that the principal is going to have pre-identified a sensitive group but not send communication to the whole community is not a good idea. So there should be a protocol where there is communication to the full school community via email um, and a connected. I mean, we're talking about health and safety and we can't assume that the principal has been notified by every parent that has a student with mold sensitivity, nor can we assume that every parent knows yet that their child has a sensitivity. And the same goes for the staff, for the employees, the teachers and everyone else in the building. So yes, it may take time to remediate and certain uh, people, whether it's students or staff, may need to not be in the building while remediation is being done in order to make the, the most healthy decision for them. And parents can't make the best decision for their children when they're not given timely information. So is there a protocol that is missing that piece that can have that put in where it's in writing? We, and can, we can take a look at what we have and um, see, see if there's any additional information that's needed there. Okay. Because yeah. that's I, I think perhaps to the extent there exists a policy about, the, about environmental safety in our buildings, that may in fact be the fertile place to address communication, whether in the policy or the rule. Um, remember, there are also, with, with reports to the health suite, there's record keeping that's occurring there, and there's communication between the nurse and families at the place. But nonetheless, to the extent there's the, there's the, the pressing value of communication, there exists a policy that can be readily modif modified by a policy review committee with regard to specific communication um, amendments to the existing protocol for when mold is identified in a building. It can easily be done. It's not very difficult. And um, there will be two folks returning to the board who have experience on this committee. Um, I want to thank you so much. Any additional questions the board members have, they can certainly forward them to you. I appreciate your willingness to come forward very, very, uh, you know, we, we scheduled this, uh, I want to say the week before last, so that uh, you all had some time to put something together, and I appreciate the responsiveness and the willingness to come and, and discuss it quite, quite openly. So thank, thank you, you so much, much, and let's all get you all, get you all back to your families. We're actually 22 minutes after we were supposed to have left here. Thank you so much. Thank you.